Hi, uh, welcome to our latest webinar. It's great to see so many of us here. Uh, today, this webinar is uh, part of Heart Unions Week, which is all about building the union and building power in our workplaces. Uh, so today, we've got two fabulous trade union organisers to talk to us just about how we do that. Uh, so remember, you can ask questions in the chat box uh, at any point um, and get involved. Uh, so take it away, Rowan and Stuart. Yeah, uh, I'm Stuart. I um, have been involved in the Yorkshire TUC's patrols, the workers' patrols, where we go into workplaces and uh, talk to people, get them signed up. Um, yeah. And I'm Rowan, I'm an organiser with the Bakers' Union, currently working on a campaign called Sheffield Needs a Pay Rise. Um, just echoing what Amy said, we'd love it if you guys could like chat to us in the chat box throughout the session. So maybe if you could kick off by saying like why you joined this session, that would be that would be really cool. Um, so just to introduce like what this session is going to be about. Um, so thinking about why, what is an organising conversation? We talk about that a lot. It's kind of like a strange phrasing, but what is an organising conversation and why do we have them? Um, so really, really simply, an organising conversation is a purposeful, time-bound, structured conversation, uh, which is aiming to move another worker to do something. Um, it could be various different things, depending on uh, where you are at in a campaign or what you're doing in your workplace. Um, some of those things that we can name is you might be trying to build relationships with colleagues. Uh, you might be trying to identify issues that you could uh, fight on. You might be trying to recruit new workers to your union. Um, you might be trying to develop existing members, or develop leaders and try and get people to take on new roles. Um, you might be trying to build union density uh, in your workplace. You might be already running a campaign and you're trying to organise a winning campaign. Um, and ultimately, like we're trying to improve working conditions and uh, our co-workers' lives. Um, so in this in this session, we're basically going to go through like a tried and tested conversational structure uh, that succeeds in doing some or all of the above, depending what you're trying to get out of your conversation. Um, so yeah, that that's basically what we're going to go through. Is there any? Did anyone say on the chat box anything? What yeah. they've joined that we might be able to add in? Yeah. So we had Alan. Uh, he's a fairly new rep out of. Uh, he's fairly new rep in the workplace, and he's hoping to get more tips about organising conversations. Uh, and then we've also got Sarah and Geraldine uh, from Unison. Uh, they're having a bit of a re ready for a bit of a refresh and getting ready for Heart Unions. Um, we've got Lawrence um, from NUJ. Uh, they're joining because they because they're reps and they want to be more effective at recruitment. Uh, Paul from Bentley Motors is senior rep. Yeah, to pick up tips for Heart Unions Week. Great. Yeah. So I think that's exactly what we're going to try and cover i think whether like you've never had one of these like purposeful conversations where you've sat down with one of your colleagues and tried to get them to do something before or whether you do this every day whether it, like you're a full-time officer like me and it's your job it's really good to like go back to basics and like remind ourselves um of this structure because like it does work um it's tried and tested and it's led to lots of winning campaigns like across the world throughout history um so just to give a little bit of a outline as like an example context of how you might be doing these conversations um my own campaign sheffield needs a pay rise that i work for um how we use this like conversational method to organize and win is um like stuart said uh with the tuc patrols we we go into workplaces uh to speak to specifically low paid workers um and we go into into the workplaces uh and speak to people cold like off the bat um about what issues they're facing at work and like what they want to do about it um it's an agitational conversation so you're trying to get to the root of um of why people might be angry about the way they're being treated at work um and using that to motivate people to come together uh in a union to win um i think most of you guys will be speaking to people that you already know so like your colleagues and we're going to talk a bit later about how that can be uh easier and more difficult in different ways um but yeah so there's like uh hopefully once you've got this like conversational structure in your back pocket you'll be able to use it like in various different situations uh to build your union yeah so what we're going to start with um and if you can ask basically we're going to start with do's and don'ts so things that work well in an organizing conversation as well as things that you might want to try and avoid 
um, maybe as we're doing this, as we're kind of going through ones from our experiences of um, what works and what doesn't, you could maybe, um, people could ask, not ask questions, but contribute um, your suggestions of good or bad organising conversations that you've seen, and we can have a little bit of a chat about them. So um, coming from some of ours, um, some of the ones that we've got on the slide, obviously we've got a few up on there. Um, you know, conversations are the bread and butter of organising. So it's it's really important that you think about um, what you're doing in them and go in prepared. I think a key thing, like just literally learning everything there is to know about this work. I know that sounds maybe slightly um, slightly weird, but that that's what it's about. Like ask um, potentially if you've got um, colleagues who are already organized and already in the union, ask them about their experiences with talking to this worker, you know, research about them so that you can be prepared, well prepared, maybe think about the kind of concerns they might have in advance so that you can anticipate them and, and, and work through them. But basically there's no um, replacement for, for preparing. And, and um, so that's a do. I don't know if Rowan, you have a don't. Uh, a don't, so like our, our top tip for don'ts and we on the train down from Sheffield we were having yeah. a conversation about some of the uh, less successful organising conversations that either we've conducted or been uh, part of um, and I think the absolute number one don't is like you're not there to sell something to the worker, you're not there to even persuade them of anything, you're there to get to know what um, what their core motivations are and that's how you're going to get them involved their the tools of how you're going to organize them is their own words and their own um self-interest so top tip don't talk at the worker um but listen and ask open questions i think Stuart yeah. had a example of when you've with, done something yeah like. when you've been involved in student organizing you see the talking at people quite a lot i think maybe it's true in all, in all organizing but i remember my, myself included going around halls of residence um, and asking people to come on demos for free education and kind of giving a five minute lecture on why they should go and unsurprisingly it didn't bring that many good results. I think it works better if you ask open questions and because ultimately you're trying to move a worker to do something and you want to go on their terms. So um, someone's not going to relate to you if you're going to, if you're just talking at them about what they should they sh what you think they should do they've got to come to that decision themselves otherwise it's not really organizing cool. um another do is schedule a time so like we said at the beginning these are like purposeful conversations you'll know what you want to get out of them um at the start so schedule a time it's not really a chat that you could just have uh in in five or ten minutes really quickly because you're trying to get to like the the deep-seated um, anger that people have um, about the way that they're being treated at work. So it takes a little bit of time, but on the flip side, it's also not like a timeless conversation where you're just gonna chit chat for hours about like what you saw on the TV. Um, you are trying to get something quite specific out of it. So I think, yeah, we've put on the slide 30 to 60 minutes. I'd generally say like 45 minutes is what to aim for that you can get out of it what you need um without it becoming unruly um yeah and I, but at the same time i guess if you manage to get a 10 minute chat with someone definitely take it it's it's, it's not um it's not as good as you could have hoped but it, it might be a starting point to try and get that conversation down the line you might be able to ask them to meet up again um yeah any other ones that aren't necessarily as self-explanatory on there so um one of the things that we we put down there is, is similar to the talking at workers, but um, another don't is to not treat the union as a, a transactional service or a kind of, um, so you don't wanna go um, and say to a worker, um, you've got to join the union because of these X, Y, Z benefits. And you're not a salesperson. We're trying to organize these people. We're trying to uh, encourage them to use their own power to transform their lives. Um, telling people that a union gives you discounts at Alton Towers or um, life insurance uh, deals is not is not. I mean, maybe that's that's just, that's all very well. That's good. I'm not criticising that necessarily. <laughs> but um, what you're really trying to do is empower them. So don't treat the union like it's a service provider. And then maybe one 
last one two things that go quite well together is like practice so we've put practice 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 and reflect um and like we said sometimes that can be easier actually doing it with someone you don't know so joining a campaign either your local acorn branch or if there's uh tucs doing patrols near where you are um going in and speaking to people you don't know sometimes that can be easier or for most people it's probably going to be getting a colleague that you already know or even a friend at home uh who you can bounce this back with yeah. and do um do a role play but also just like get started like throw yourself in it's not going to be perfect the first time you do it and that doesn't matter and i think that goes with the don't of don't beat yourself up if it doesn't go perfectly when you first start you'll come away from every conversation thinking oh when they said that i should have said that and when they said this i should have said this but um the more you do it the better you'll the better you'll get absolutely yeah and, I, and just to add to that i would say there's you're always going to find your own style people like you want to relate to the person you're talking to so you're going to you're going to use different phrases to other to other organizers and that's a good thing but you're only going to be able to work out what works best for you if you go out and do it just keep doing it um people think there's some kind of magic bullet that's like a perfect password line that will just make a worker open up to you there's no such thing it's about trying to find where you feel you can work best in a conversation amy did anyone have any good examples of conversations they've been in that maybe haven't been as all good conversations all good. um so teresa has said that one-to-one -one conversations she agrees that one-to-one -one conversations are always the best way of encouraging new members uh, and she finds that personal stories uh, really resonate mm -hmm. in trade union um, yeah absolutely good. and and saying again it comes back to that like relating yourself to the worker if you're coming from your own personal stories you're going to build a much more strong relationship with them. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So now we're going to get onto the nitty gritty of like how to structure these conversations. Um, I think it's probably important to say this isn't like a rigid um, structure that you need to kind of be like, okay, now I need to move on to the next section. Um, but it's just, the more you do it, the more you'll develop your own way of phrasing things and the more comfortable you'll feel with like the flow of the conversation. Um, but these are sort of some elements that it's important to include and that if you sort of sequence them in this way, you're more likely to get the outcomes that you want. Um, so the first, the first section is introduction, which I think is probably like quite, quite self-explanatory, but Stuart's gonna talk a bit in a minute about how um, the introduction needs to be quite brief. This isn't where you're gonna try and like put the whole vision of what you're trying to do at the start. The main thing that you're trying to um, get out of this conversation is to get the other person talking. Um, I think it says on the slide, you want them to be talking at least like 70% of the time. Um, so the introduction needs to um, sort of lodge that off. Um, the next section, is issues and agitation um so that's probably going to be like the bulk of your conversation which is just getting them to talk about um what issues they're having at work what it is that gets them motivated what they don't like what they do like um and agitation is the kind of like way that we get that out of people and get them kind of like geared up to want to do something about it um vision is the kind of key bit where you're going to be talking the most so that's um sort of the your path to win how like what what a trade union is what it means to be part of it how what you could achieve together um then one bit that's often missed out of these conversations but is really really important especially in places where you've got quite volatile uh, employers is the what you're up against section um which is letting people know some of the arguments against the union and against what you're doing so that they're armed with those straight from the beginning uh, and then the really, really important bit that you need to make sure you never, ever forget is to call the question. So make sure you ask whatever you came in to get out of this conversation. Um, you make sure you definitely ask the other person to do something. Um, that includes sharing with them your plan to win and also giving them some what we call assignments, which maybe sounds a bit <laughs> official, uh, but giving people some some tasks and some ways to get involved. Um, it's really important that you don't leave and forget to ask them what you what you wanted to ask yeah them. so should we so 
that's a rose given a brief overview of the kind of general structure um, and it's good to keep that in mind and work out thinking about how you're going to move from one to the next and always thinking um, how you're going to get there um, so just very briefly on the introductions um, as rose said it's not um, the place where you're going to sit down and tell them to join the union and the union's this and here's how you pay and here's what you're going to do next it's about easing that person in they might be quite anxious to meet you or they might be very excited um, it's easing them in building some trust between you and the worker um, to the point where you can get them get them talking about the issues they care about because that's ultimately why you're there you're about you're there to get their issues and agitate to to encourage them to um, take action on those issues um, so yeah it's very much be friendly ask open questions get them talking to the point where you get as soon as possible to that crucial stage of uh, getting issues and agitating them so wh what do we mean by agitation well basically this is the this is the point where you're raising the workers expectations you're encouraging them to believe that a different approach is possible to um see that the way that the things run in their workplace doesn't have to be that way and if they could take action um it could change so a good i think a good opening line for that is to just say um if you could change three things in your workplace tomorrow what would they be and if and and usually that does get them and i i found on the patrol um saying that question first rather than giving them issues like what you know how much do you get paid what are your holiday times asking them that question it might be something very unexpected we've got people talking about security um in their workplace talking about um trust and respect from bosses or um harassment all the, all those kind of things that you're not going to know about are ultimately that they're going to tell you the things that agitate the most um and if they don't give you three just say come on just give us one and and then um, you're going to try and basically encouraging them to see one that a different approach is possible, encouraging them to dream about a different um, way in which uh, about taking control, about them taking control of their workplace and their lives. And two, um, encouraging them to think that if they take action, if they form a strong organisation with their co-workers, they can change those things, which I guess brings us to um, a useful um, tool which we've got in here is, um, are we going to go straight to that? Yeah, to the agitational questions. Yeah, so I think that's another slide. So the, these are just 15 agitational questions for your back pocket. So basically while you're in, like I said, that'll be the, the main bulk of your conversation where you're trying to get the other person talking and you're trying to get to the root of what they really care about. Um, Sometimes you go in with all the best intentions to just listen and you're ready to just sit there and listen and then the other person just doesn't really talk or they don't really open up. Um, so it's good to have these open questions that are some of them a little bit spiky to just have them in your back pocket so that if the conversation dries up a little bit, um, you can say things like... Um, you said on the train, didn't you, that that second question do you work hard really brings yeah, out that's my so that's my favorite one so especially with people who maybe sometimes they're like actually maybe everything's okay and yeah i'm on minimum wage and it's a bit rubbish but like what do i expect i work in a fast food restaurant and the my favorite question to always ask is just like oh what don't you work hard um and i find that when you ask people are always like oh no yeah i do work hard actually yeah i do work hard maybe i do deserve 15 pound an hour mm -hmm. um so yeah that's a that's a really good one to have in your back pocket um were there any others that you particularly yeah asked yet? um i think yeah i think i like that one and i like do you des the one over there do you deserve to be treated like that i think because a lot of the time people say oh i can't find an issue or people are oh, this there's not a particular issue and i think that's very much i don't think that's ever really the case there are always issues that people have at work it's just whether or not people believe that those can change and i think when you um encourage them to think about what they deserve and um basically encourage them to see themselves as having some dignity um that's when you get them talking about changing them um because i i don't believe that there are, there is a workplace that doesn't have an issue i think it's about 
either building enough trust with that worker to make help them um, open up to you about what they'd like to change or basically getting them to see that things are possible it is possible to change them uh, and I think that's ultimately the biggest stumbling block and I think that's why these questions it's about evoking that question about what they deserve not just um, talking about the specifics of what they're paid but what they deserve because um, I think every trade union struggle is about dignity and um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so then once you've sort of got a, a fuller picture of um, what this person's going through, what they're um, passionate about, what they're struggling with, um, then you can move on to talking about um, the vision. So what your uh, what what you could achieve if everyone came together. Um, so I think Stuart was going to give an example of like quite a general. Yeah. So I think at this stage it's about you you you've got to think you've got to obviously judge it based on the person you're talking to. But um, the basic thing is you're trying to encourage someone to see a union as a solution. Um, you, you know, and it, it might be as simple as saying you and your co-workers are going to come together um, to build a, an organization and you're going to build it and make it stronger. And only by doing that, only through collective action, um, will you be able to actually change things. And I think that's where, um, you know, this is the bit where you're educating the worker. And I think it's crucial that it comes after your agitation. Um, this is the point at which you'd hope the worker is actually asking you, how will I change these things and how is it going to, um, how, how are we going to build this campaign? Um, and I think you've got to mostly assume that people don't know much about trade unions. And I think that's why bringing examples of wins and um, trade union campaigns is really helpful, which is, yeah. yeah. So an example that I use in my work, I get to the point where I I'm saying to people, say it's a McDonald's worker that I'm sat opposite. Um, so what would happen if all the McDonald's workers in Sheffield came together and went out on strike? OK, well, what would happen if all the fast food workers in Sheffield came together and went out on strike? OK, well, what would happen if everyone on minimum wage in Sheffield came together and we all went out on strike together? What do you think we could achieve then? Um, and then I use examples of how the mixed strikes in London have won uh, pay rises, how the spoon strikes in Brighton have won uh abolishing the youth rate um and you try and tailor the vision depending on what issues uh matter to that person so if that person really cares about uh getting more hours and zero hours contracts then you're probably going to try and bring in an example of um how that could be how that could be achieved and like Stuart said if you've got an example of where that has been achieved somewhere else by workers like them uh that's really helpful um i also depending how the conversation's gone sometimes have like some videos from strikes on social media or like pictures of other workers who um again involved in the movement and say like look at this is, this is the movement this is what's going on this is all these people this is what you could be part of um and that bit yeah once you've got people kind of fired up the vision section is around like getting people really excited mm. um yeah absolutely yeah. so the next section um, and as Rowan says, this is often a bit that people leave out and um, basically it's basically saying to the worker what they're up against because, and I think this is the crucial thing is here that you're being honest um, because everything you're doing in an organising conversation has to be honest. You're there with the specific intention of encouraging a worker to take sometimes risky action um, for their own interests. Uh, and the great thing about being in the labour movement is that we can be sincere in our intentions because our intentions are good. Um, but at the same time, we also need to be realistic with the worker and, and encourage them to um, prepare themselves for what they're going to be up against. Um, so, uh, and in, in some kind of, in a lot of the American trade union context, they call this inoculation or what we would call vaccination. And I think it's quite a good... Um, uh, metaphor basically you're vaccinating the worker with a little bit of the boss's poison you're saying you're encouraging them to think about the boss's opposition to help them prepare for a potentially much um more serious opposition from the from the boss um yeah and i think do you have a good example yeah. of, of 
perhaps where this hasn't gone so yeah well. so just just to add to that i think like like Stuart said it's really important um to prepare the worker for what the their managers are likely to say um and because whoever tells whoever's the first person to tell them that this could that this is a stupid idea or this will never work or um they're not going to get any more hours they're more likely to believe whoever the first person is that tells them so if the first person that tells them that is their manager that's going to really deflate the person that you've got really excited whereas if the manager says that and the worker thinks like oh yeah well Stuart said they were going to tell me that so like actually like i don't think that's true um then it puts it puts them on the the front foot and like yeah like you said they're prepared um and i think i guess on top of that um again it's and i think this is a principle that runs through the whole conversation you do it with an open question you don't go your boss is going to oppose you and they're going to really you, you say right what do you think your boss would say if you joined the union or, or whatever it was um because then you're hearing the workers fears first mm -hmm. and you can respond to that and in a way you're also comforting them because some of those fears um you can say you know actually if if you're all together and, and if you're all standing together then you should be okay and but it but at the same time saying that it's going to be hard because trade union organizing is really hard yeah so yeah preparing them in in that way um but i think it's also really important to get them thinking what their other co-workers might think because especially if someone gets really excited they think everyone's just gonna agree with them and it's gonna be great and actually the most hurtful thing for people can be not what their manager says to them but if their co-worker tells them it's a stupid idea or their co-worker doesn't care um or says it'll never work or etc cetera, etc cetera. um a really good example of this was um a fast food worker who was involved in one of our campaigns and had got really really excited about going on strike and was ready to like completely tear down the big corporation that they worked for and just could not envisage why every other fast food worker in the world would not completely just agree with them straight away and um, so he after a meeting with an organizer went straight back into his place of work and pinned up the union membership forms on the <laughs> staff pin board um with a note saying like if you want to come and talk to me <laughs> like come and talk to me everyone should join the union um and then was absolutely aghast when not only was his manager pulling in, him into a room and saying like what is this about like they filled your mind with lies and we treat you really well and do you not want this job uh but also his co-workers were kind of like put off and weren't um weren't anywhere near as excited as them and some of them were actually really against it and told them it was stupid um and the effect that that had was that he then felt betrayed by the organizer who'd got him really excited because he was like you didn't tell you said that everyone was going to be involved and it was going to be this massive movement it was really exciting but no one wants to no one wants to be involved and what he did then was avoid the organizer because he felt angry and embarrassed um and that meant that that really, really exciting spark in that workplace had then like gone out. Um, and it was really, really hard for the organiser to rebuild that trust with the worker. Um, and I think we were going to mention one of our favourite quotes at that point, which is, um, workers are not made of glass, they won't break if you push them. So I think that's why people often get awkward about the section where you have to tell them that it's going to be difficult because they think oh if if I don't tell them that it's all just going to be rosy they're not going to want to be involved but actually like the workers generally know the risks um and they know what they know that their employer is going to be against it and they know that not everyone's up in arms ready to go um so you should be honest with them about that and that's yeah. going to help build your relationship with them yeah and I think that goes back I think one of our do's and don'ts one of our don'ts was don't introduce kind of white lies because you feel to make you feel more comfortable and the worker feel more comfortable. You've got to be honest about all, about all aspects of this. Um, a white lie is not going to help you down the line. Um, you need to, yeah, it's you need to be brave. Basically, I think it, it, sometimes that in a conversation can be uncomfortable, but that's exactly what organising is. That's why you're having the conversation and that's you're trying to move someone, and and it's going to be slightly uncomfortable. If, if it isn't, then it should be slightly uncomfortable an organizing conversation and don't be afraid to sort of role play sections with them so i think we'll talk about 
when you when we talk about the assignments in a bit. But I think also with the uh, what you're up against bit, you can say, okay, imagine I'm one of your colleagues, mm. try and try and recruit me to the union, um, and do a bit of role play with them in the organising conversation so that they're really prepared. Right. So this brings us to the uh, incredibly important and in, in, in this yeah an incredibly important part of the um, conversation, and that's calling the question um, and kind of as as Rowan says you know workers aren't made of glass you know don't be afraid to push them <laughs> um you're you're having a conversation you're there with a specific aim um and you um you're asking them to do something um on their on their own accord it's their decision but you're still asking them to whether it's join the union or uh, get another co-worker involved in the union or, or whatever it's sign a petition um it's crucial that you that you test just test the effectiveness of your conversation as well so um i think a really brilliant question to ask is uh, sorry i think um a brilliant approach jay mclevy a um, american trade union organizer basically says when you ask this question um don't be afraid to let the question lie there and have a bit of silence because ultimately um, if you've got the question right, it might be quite a difficult choice because sometimes it is a difficult choice for a worker to, you know, take the risk of joining a union and and, and make that bold stand and, and in front of their co-workers. So you don't want to embrace it for them. I think you need to say, right, will you join the union? And then have the awkward silence. Um, and if you don't do that, then ultimately, your, the work you're talking to isn't making their own decision on it and I think you've got to leave the space to do that. Um, do you want to talk about the next steps of that? Yeah. Um, so I think the other important thing around why we, we call it call the question is that you might think that through the conversation you've had it's obvious that basically what you're asking them to do is join the union or join this campaign or stand to be a rep or whatever it is but don't assume that that's what they've read from what you're trying to get out like be direct and make sure you actually ask yeah. them specifically what you want them to do um so it's also good at that point to share um reiterate like what the plan to win is because that will be sort of like a timeline for what you what you're going to do together going forward um so that an example a very simple simplified example of that i don't know if we put that on a slide but is um you're going to be asking them to build a network of colleagues you're going to ask them to help spread what you're doing so that they can go out and do the same thing build, bring more people in uh you're going to be asking them to communicate both with their co-workers and with you you don't want them to um even if they're finding it hard uh you don't want them to kind of go cold on you um bring the drama so that might be <laughs> go on strike or do an action or do something a bit um exciting um and ultimately force the decision makers to the table so just like really lay out this is what we're going to be doing together so it's completely um unambiguous yeah absolutely um and i think i think the the ask is always going to be different and you might even be having multiple conversations with the same worker you know we, you might have a and each of those might be a different ask um at various points in the campaign you know you might be running a big um petition or um you know whatever it is it's you, you might have a different ask and you might also pick up like Rowan says that what where someone's at but i think it, i would encourage you to make the ask slightly difficult it's always better to take that slight risk that of, of kind of pushing a worker to um to take a bold decision um because if you don't do that then then you're then you could be missing out on 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 the chance to build solidarity and and achieve justice basically um and i think yeah and i think it's crucial uh to you know have very specific um follow-up actions you know have a next meeting penciled in or a time at which you want them to do a particular thing um and I think, you know, making sure that they have all the information and tools at their um, disposal to do those actions, to go and build a network or whatever it is. 
But I think it's also important not for this action to be symbolic. You're not just asking a worker to participate in a union for the sake of it. You want their action to be meaningful. And I think that, and you want to build their confidence and build their commitment to the union. Um, yeah. So yeah, we had a little list of things that you might ask someone to do. And like Stuart said, when you get some, when you get someone to agree to do something, always um, agree a deadline together as well. So if you're going to ask them, if they say, I'm going to get four more people involved, you want to get their names and you want to know by when they're going to have spoken to those people um, so that you can follow up with them. Um, other things you might, depending where you are in a campaign, you might want them to do a picture and quote, um, which is, yeah, yeah to like that you could share on social media, like a picture of them with a quote of uh, however the issue affects them. Um, you might want to, yeah, they get them to get more people involved and get cards signed to host a meeting. Um, so maybe they work in a specific department or a branch and you want them to host a meeting specifically with um, co-workers in their workplace. Um, you might want them to come along with you to do um, either a house visit of some members or some people have said they're interested or a store visit if you're working across various locations. They could help you with list work. They could introduce you to co-workers so maybe they're they don't feel confident enough to sign someone else up themselves but they're up for like introduce taking you along to meet someone else um they could either attend or run a training uh, attend or run a meeting attend or run an event um do a phone bank help make some flyers or do some flyering do stuff on social media there's loads of different things that you can have and like Stuart said if you go for kind of the top thing you want them to do first and then have these ready to go then you can sort of like say okay you're not up for doing that right now but could you do this so that you're never leaving a meeting without them agreeing to take a step forward mm. um and i think stuart kind of touched on it but i think if you go for something a bit bolder and they say no then they said no but if you never go for it at all you're kind of doing that person a disservice because you're not allowing them the space to develop as a leader um, and yeah. that and goes against what we're trying to do so yeah and I think you know and there's going to be that discomfort you are going to ask someone to do something that's potentially out of their comfort zone um, and that might you might think oh that's slightly manipulative or whatever but it, it's not manipulative because you know if we remember we're here but with honest intentions we're here because we want to transform people's lives and we can say that directly to the worker and it's not that we you know it's not we're not going to judge that person if they don't take that decision but it ultimately is a good decision we know that um and i think i think that's why i think we need to get past that that level of discomfort and i think um it's very easy to fall back on a very simple ask because we feel uncomfortable is actually mm -hmm. sometimes we need to ask those difficult questions and you could be the person that pushes that person to realize they could do something that they never thought they could do like most people who've ever spoken in public or run a training session or um i don't know anything yeah. like that um someone probably asked you to do that as the first ever time and you probably thought that you couldn't do it but them asking you gave made you think like oh maybe i will push myself to do this um and so if you ask ask them to do something that's going to push them a little bit further then you yeah you, yeah yeah, absolutely. Giving and, and, someone an opportunity, it's not... Yeah. yeah, and if you're giving them the space to make that decision, you're respecting that. You know, you're you're saying, would you be up for doing this? And leaving that silence there, you, you know, you're re you're respecting their decision and your understanding of their, of the fact that it's a difficult decision. Because all of these things, and I think another thing to mention is those assignments, getting a picture quote signed or whatever, these are structure tests, which you could have run a whole training session on probably itself but they're tests of the power of the union the tests of members ability to show their power to demonstrate their power to the boss and to each other um, and each of these asks is going to be doing that and you're going to be building towards the ultimate structure test which is obviously a strike I, potentially you're always building you're always wanting to build your workers capacity to strike at least because that's that's ultimately the power of a trade union Cool. Um, so then we're just going to quickly touch on handling objections and I've written in our notes, we could do a whole session on this because <laughs> obviously there are sort of like 
depend it depends totally on what workplace you're organizing in as to what sort of objections might come up but you will find the more of these conversations you have there'll probably be a core sort of four or five that are the ones that always come up and the more that you practice the more confident that you'll feel in um in tackling them uh i think stuart's going to talk through the sort of a a framework that we can use to handle objections that means that I, th I think handling objections can be the the most off-putting thing that you think oh I can't have one of these conversations because what if they say something and I don't know how to answer it and what if they ask about something really complicated and I don't know the answer and really like there's actually quite a simple framework yeah. that you can use to um, answer any objection that comes up. Yeah so this is a framework called AAR um, so I'll just basically a acknowledge or affirm basically what you're doing there is respecting uh, that objection and usually it is an understandable objection so, so for instance it's um i'm worried about being victimized by my boss and you can go yeah absolutely i completely respect uh, see that i think it's you know it's a difficult position you're in showing that you sympathize with them and you don't take it lightly and then answer and this is crucially about being honest and saying Yes, I mean, so it's, if it's uh, a worker worried about being victimised, you can go, yes, there is that risk, there absolutely is. Um, and But, um, you know, the, what we're here to do is, is to build a strong organisation of workers. And if you're, to get, if you're together with your co-workers, um, you can withstand that, um, uh, that risk. Um, but obviously that is, you are taking a risk, so yes. Uh, and then redirect. So this is about, um, asking questions to bring it back to the agitation, bring it back to their issues or bring it back to the um, the vision about saying, well, what um, what do you think you would do? Um, do you think your workers would, would stand by you if you um, uh, if you were victimised? It's, it's, it's questions like that. Um, yeah. In an organising context, actually, the, the objections are sometimes a bit easier because it's, it's you, they're usually on your side. Um, it's not like a, a kind of labour doorstep question, like mm -hmm. where someone says the, something completely different to, to your worldview. Like a lot of these questions are quite understandable ones that you need to be honest in your response to. Yeah. Another way to redirect the example that Stuart was saying was to say like, oh, you're worried about being victimised. What would happen if everyone in the workplace came together and we all stood together? And yeah. then that gets them back onto... Um, onto the vision. Um, another common one that we were going to talk about that often comes up is um, it won't change anything or um, yeah, it, we, we can't win, those sort of ones. Um, so yeah, again, you acknowledge, like understand why you might feel like that. Um, this sort of stuff hasn't happened in our workplace for a, for a long time. Yeah. Uh, um, I can't remember the last time we, we won something against the boss, that sort of stuff. Um, answer them, so again, like directly, concisely and honestly. So, it abs but it absolute, we absolutely can win if we do X, Y, Z and then you re... Um, you wouldn't be there. If you, <laughs> yeah, yeah, cover over the vision again. Um, and then ask them a question that both makes them feel like you're answering what they're saying, but gets you back on track so maybe well why do you think everyone's feeling so downtrodden why do you think other people are feeling like we can't yeah. win anything and then that gets them back onto um onto the right route yeah absolutely and i think to be fair that last question the last um objection of i don't believe things will change very often most objections are that objection if you really sometimes people might make an objection like oh, I don't have the time or um, we're not allowed to do that. Usually when when push comes to shove, they are telling you that they don't believe it will change. And that's that's your main task as an organiser, I think, is making people believe that they can change things. Um, and the more you practise, the more solid the vision will be, the more better you'll be at agitating them so that that objection is less likely to come up anyway. Um, I think that's generally everything we wanted to cover. I don't know if there's any questions that come up in the chat box that we might be able to discuss. Uh, yes, fabulous. We've got a few questions. We've got time for a few questions. Um, so do you, I'll give you them all at once. 
Okay, so <laughs> number one, how would you handle a conversation in an unorganized workplace uh, where maybe you're the only member? Mm -hmm. uh, what tips do you have to recruit young members who say they don't know what a trade union is? Mm -hmm. Um, and do you have any tips for recruiting precarious workers who are part of the gig economy who aren't all in the same workplace? Mm -hmm. Cool. I think all those three questions talk to <laughs> my yeah. hand up, especially the first two. Um, so what I would just say is basically what we've been saying throughout is like, yes, you absolutely can do it and you just need to go out and start. Um, like Stuart was saying, I think there's so many different sessions that we could hinge off this one around like mapping your workplace and thinking about where you want to start having these conversations. But genuinely, like I said, day in, day out, I'm going into fast food restaurants and cafes and bars um, that I don't work in and striking up conversations with predominantly young um, workers who have never heard of a trade union before. Um, and really it is just these tools of asking them like, what's it like to work here? Um, and getting them getting them to the, the core maybe not a question as general as what's it like to work here but um those 15 agitational questions that we had earlier um just being confident in going and starting setting up some of these conversations with people um so yeah in terms of tips for doing it in an unorganized workplace is just like start <laughs> and you yeah. don't just to have the confidence you definitely can do it, it has to start somewhere um most places i've ever worked haven't had trade union agreements so we've had to like start something up from scratch um but yeah it has to start so it should start with you um again with young people i think it's it's the same as with anyone i've actually found that young people's appetite for this is a lot higher than you would think like people um have a bit of an attitude that uh, young people don't know what trade unions are and they don't care about it but actually they do and mm -hmm. as trade unionists it's our job to go and like spread the word and get them excited about mm -hmm. it um yeah, I think particularly those first two, it's very much like it's obviously difficult when you've got an unorganised workplace and, and when you've got people who don't know what a trade union is. But then on the flip side, it's actually quite, you know, the world is your oyster. You can do whatever you want with this because if you're the person who's the first person to talk to, about trade unions to someone, there's not going to be that baggage of bureaucracies that people or bad experiences, you know, you can just go straight in and you can give your examples of what, what you think um, a trade union could do and i think fundamentally it's all about bringing it to the workers issues agitating them on their issues that they care about and building from there um i think if anything you know i don't i don't i don't think lack of trade union knowledge really gets in the way of that if, if you know you can just get down to the nitty-gritty of how of what they care about and what what they're interested in i guess on the precarious gig economy um i think using this approach to organizing very much focusing on um deep organizing in conversations is what has seen the rise of a lot of um grassroots unions like the iwgb and the iww organizing um and i think actually i mean i think this model works in all workplaces but arguably it's only deep organizing and deep conversations that can organize that sector um and i think i guess poten potentially one challenge is that you your workers might not all know each other and so often you're having conversations with strangers um but again with practice i think you can get good at that i think potentially with those kinds of conversations which is potentially this is the experience i have most with is talking to strangers um it you really got to nail that first section of just building a relationship sometimes you're just and if you don't you don't but i think crucially it's just trying to create that warm relationship uh, getting them talking i think that's the, the biggest stumbling block and once you've got past that you yeah. can take it away and I, I have just a couple of things to add on precarity i think like because so much work is precarious now that it's i don't think we should think about like oh there's these particular sectors that are precarious that are particularly difficult to organize like most young people are working in, in precarious yeah. workplaces now so it's having that conversation with them getting to the root of their issues getting them agitated and then being like well if it doesn't start with you who's it going to start with um yeah. and like for example the weatherspoon strikes were started by someone who was about to quit but then he thought well actually if i stop if i don't work at weatherspoons 
what, I'm going to go and work at a Mitchell and Butler's pub or a Green King pub and it's going to be the same issues again and again. So actually it can put people in a better position to organise. Like people, mm. I think, often assume that people in precarious work are just doing it temporarily um, and so they don't really care about their work conditions but I think you'll find when you talk to them that most people do and then in terms of people not all being together in one um, workplace that is obviously a challenge but I think actually if you speak to these workers you'll find that often there are places where people congregate so for example with Deliveroo riders the way that that app works means that they have to congregate in a certain part in the city and it's just about talking to the workers and finding out um, where those places are yeah Fabulous. Um, well, that's all we've got time for today. And thank you very much. Uh, that, that was absolutely fantastic. Uh, and it was great to see so many people logging in. We've now got nearly 210 people oh. watching. Uh, so thank you for joining today. Uh, and I hope that you've learned a bit about building power and, and building the union. So go out and have those conversations. Um, the, the Next week is Heart Unions Week and we've got uh, a series of things going on. Uh, most notably is our um, we've got a mass organizing call which you can join uh, on the Monday uh, and the link is on the slide um, we were going to say one last final thing that we're going to say to people about having good conversations and that is practicing and do, doing it the more you do it the better you get there's no secret trick you just have to go and do it and I think if you want practice if you don't feel comfortable yet talking to your co-workers or if you want some more practice find out if you've got a local acorn group you can go along door knocking to find out if 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 you live in yorkshire come along to one of our patrols and you can go in and talk to people in their workplaces or just head into town and have a chat to a delivery worker or whatever it is okay thank you very much